Good morning. Welcome. My name is Edgar Figueroa, and it's our pleasure to have you in person. And uh, thank you for making the trip out to Chicago to be with us this week. Uh, it is um, just terrific to be able to get back in person and uh, reinitiate the part of our culture, a core ingredient of uh, what makes us successful, which is um, to get together in person. Uh, throughout the year at various places in the world to uh, continue the good work of advancing Wi-Fi, and uh, we really appreciate your being here. This morning, we'll uh, orient you with the agenda for today. I mentioned a uh, distinguished speaker. We have uh, FCC Chairwoman uh, Jessica Rosenworcel. At this point, it's uh, my great pleasure to welcome uh, Chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel. Good morning. Let me give you a proper introduction. Uh, and. Uh, at my age, I need my glasses to do just that. Um, Federal Communications Commission Chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel works to promote greater opportunity, accessibility, and affordability in our communication services in order to ensure that all Americans get a fair shot at 21st century success. From fighting to protect net, net neutrality to ensuring access to the Internet of Things uh, and uh, access for students caught in the homework gap, she has been consistent champion for connecting all. She's a leader in spectrum policy and is responsible for developing policies to help expand the reach of broadband to schools, libraries, hospitals, and households across the country, and also for developing new ways to support wireless services from Wi-Fi to video and the Internet of Things. She has observed that most of our lives run on a licensed spectrum. And under her leadership, the commission has initiated a proceeding related to the access and use of spectrum for IoT. She supported the FCC's efforts to permit the use of the six gigahertz band for unlicensed operations. And when the Court of Appeals upheld the commission's decision, she observed that six gigahertz Wi-Fi will offer more access in more places, faster speeds, and better performance from Wi-Fi networks, helping to connect everyone everywhere. Chairwoman Rosenworcel brings over two decades of communications policy experience and public service to the FCC. Prior to joining the agency, she served as Senior Communications Counsel for the United States Senate Committee on Commerce, Science, and Transportation under the leadership of Senator John D. Rockefeller IV and Senator Daniel Inouye. Please join me in welcoming the Wi-Fi Alliance FCC Chairwoman Jessica Rosenworcel. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, we hear you. Terrific. It is terrific to be able to join you virtually for what I understand is your first annual meeting in several years. I think it's fair to say that we have a lot to catch up on. Thank you for that kind introduction, Edgar, and also for your leadership of the Wi Fi Alliance. Now, one of the most important amenities, though, is the invisible system. That's because there's a cloud of Wi-Fi that hovers over the park, bringing activities that even the most ambitious urban planner never could have imagined. So the trees that shaded city dwellers out for a stroll in decades past now help because they keep the glare off of touch screens. And despite the fears that wireless technology would drive us all into lives of wireless isolation, you know, the opposite is happening. Lincoln Park, like so many parks in so many other cities, is returning to the role it filled a generation ago. A place to share, read, write, and socialize. Really, in short, a place to communicate. And the way I see it, that's the power of Wi-Fi. It can draw us together and help us connect, both physically and digitally. You see it in Lincoln Park, and you see it in so many other places now, too. So many of us are online at the same time using two or three devices at once. We're logging on for work meetings and talking with friends for high school physics lectures and online yoga classes, for grocery shopping, and definitely for binge watching. Wi-Fi, you know, helps power all of it. And by all of it, I mean the activities that have helped so many of us maintain some semblance of normalcy during the pandemic and keep the economy open for business. Now, if we're gonna be honest, we have to acknowledge that the last few years have also demonstrated with total clarity that not all of us are equally equipped for this technology-enabled future. There are big disparities when it comes to accessing the digital age, and being consigned to the wrong side of the digital divide 
doesn't just mean lack of access to technology. It means lack of access to employment opportunities, news, education, healthcare, and more. Now, for years, I've been saying that the homework gap is the cruelest part of this digital divide. And when I say homework gap, I'm talking about the roughly 17 million students in this country who lack the home broadband connection they need to complete online assignments from their teachers. I've seen it firsthand in rural areas, urban areas, everywhere in between. You know who these kids are. They're the ones who sit in parking lots late in the evening just to get a Wi-Fi signal to do their nightly schoolwork. They're the ones who slide into booths at fast food restaurants every afternoon and do their homework with fizzy drinks and a side of fries. You know, they're also the parents who cobble together connectivity trips to the homes of relatives and friends with, and sometimes to libraries with limited hours just to help their kids get their assignments done. Now, the pandemic made these inequities worse. Classes moved online. We went from having millions of students who couldn't do their nightly homework at all to having millions of kids who couldn't even go to school at all. That's because children's living in households without a reliable internet connection or consistent access to Wi-Fi were locked out of the virtual classroom. So that homework gap became an education gap. Now, today I want to share with you two ways we're working to tackle this problem once and for all and how we're leveraging Wi-Fi to do it. So here's the first. In March of 2021, Congress passed a law to help establish the Emergency Connectivity Fund. That's the American's first ever program to help specifically close the homework gap. The program provides schools and libraries with funding for devices, as well as Wi-Fi hotspots, modems, routers, and a whole bunch of other equipment to help connect students and library patrons who lack internet access at home. And it's already making a big impact. To prepare for my remarks today, we started combing through some of the successful applicants. And it's striking what you see. We found that in Bedford, Massachusetts, the Emergency Connectivity Fund not only supported devices, it supported 1,500 broadband hotspots available to students. And the local superintendent told us these tools and the Wi-Fi connections they've made possible are helping their students grow academically and thrive socially and emotionally. But it's not just in Massachusetts. We saw the same thing in Westerville, Ohio, where Emergency Connectivity Fund has supported access to Chromebooks as well as Wi-Fi hotspots for all of their middle schoolers. And one of their local administrators told us this is going to increase students' home access to internet, and it's going to change the game because it's going to allow them to meet their students' learning needs at home. So we've got stories like these all across the country. And in fact, we've already reached more than 12 and a half million students in this program who might otherwise be left offline and locked out of the virtual classroom. So when you stand back and look at it, what you see is clear. Wi-Fi has democratized internet access. All right, now here's the second thing we're doing. As the funds available in the Emergency Connectivity Fund program draw down, we're already thinking about the FCC's next big push to close the homework gap. And again, it involves Wi-Fi. And I'm talking about Wi-Fi on school buses. And to explain why I think this is important, let me share a story from a trip I took a while back to Hatch, New Mexico. These were in the pre-pandemic days. Now, Hatch is a rural community. And if you've ever heard of it, the odds are it's because it's known for the chilies that are grown in its dusty soil. And when I was there, I met a high school student named Jonah Madrid. He played for the football team. Now, Jonah explained to me that being an athlete in a rural community was not easy. You had to play teams that were far away. So when the school day ended, he would pile on a bus with his teammates, and they'd often travel an hour and a half just to play a football game. And when the game was over, he and the equipment was packed up, the team got back on the bus and traveled back home to Hatch. After making it home, Jonah would sit in the school parking lot, lingering in the pitch black dark, a glowing computer in his lap, doing his homework at night in the only place he had Wi-Fi access. Now, listen to Jonah, I couldn't help but thinking about how much better off he would be if he could have been doing online assignments on that bus ride home, rather than waiting to get to the school parking lot just so he could connect. Now, the same could be said of so many other young people around this country. Setting aside the long trips to football games, there are over 25 million children in the country who take the school bus to school every day. In rural areas, that ride can be long. It's easily an hour to get to school and an hour to return home at the end of the day. And listen, it's good for young people to spend time daydreaming, decompressing, talking to friends. But wouldn't it also be nice if that ride time was available to connect for homework? Now, the good news is we have a workable common sense solution. We can connect our school buses and make them Wi-Fi enabled. Think of it as Wi-Fi on wheels. 
we know it works because we've seen it done before. Years ago, I went to Coachella Valley in California, not for the musical festival, but to visit the local school district because the local school district did something. They provided all of their students with tablets. And there was just one problem. The superintendent noticed that many of the students had no internet access in the trailer homes where they lived near the agricultural fields. And so they would sit outside in the, outside the school after the final bell had rung. And this too was a rural area where students typically rode the bus a long time after farming, a long time out to the farming areas where they lived to get to school and they took the same long ride home at night. So he thought instead of having them sit outside the school at the, after the end of the school day, he would come up with a plan to equip their school buses with Wi-Fi routers. He turned ride time into connected time for their schoolwork. And I visited Coachella and what I saw was transformative. Now, during this last year, we also saw the same thing happen with FCC support. In fact, when we set up the emergency connectivity fund, we followed the law very carefully, but we also said to school districts and libraries, if you've got a creative idea that fits in the law, well, you should show up and come our way. And a bunch of school districts actually requested funding to bring Wi-Fi to school buses. In fact, to date, the FCC has committed over $35 million to help schools do this. One of my favorite examples is Sand Springs, Oklahoma, where they equipped their 40 school buses with Wi-Fi kits. And according to the district's IT director, the benefits are big. As she tells it, students now complete their assignments in transit during and during long extracurricular trips. It helps keep the kids safe and focused on their schoolwork while they ride. Plus, and I love this, the community in Sand Springs has made plans to park these buses overnight in neighborhoods where connectivity is lacking so the kids living nearby can get more opportunity to complete their schoolwork. So I think what's worked for the Emergency Connectivity Fund could work for another FCC program that's provided vital support to help schools and libraries access to high-speed modern communications. That program is known as E-Rate. And I think right now is the right time to do this. That's why I've circulated a plan to my colleagues to make Wi-Fi on school buses eligible for E-rate support nationwide. It's not a far leap to make. It's both consistent with the law and the history of the program. After all, for many years, E-rate supported the use of communications for school buses. But back in the day, that just meant wireless phones used by drivers and teachers when they were shepherding students to and from schools. I think we can advance right now to say that Wi-Fi should be standard on our school buses and we can use the E-Rate program to do it. Because in the end, this isn't about helping students like Jonah who just struggle with an internet connection at home. Every kid who rides the bus and feels like they don't have enough time in the day to get their homework done while juggling activities and maybe a job, well, they'll all benefit. So this idea I wanna point out has enjoyed bipartisan support on Capitol Hill because there's a group that's led by Senator Ben Ray Lujan Senator Lindsey Graham and Representative Peter Welch, who've sponsored similar efforts. So I hope my FCC colleagues join with me to make this the next common sense change to E-rate and the next meaningful step to expand the reach of Wi-Fi and narrow the homework gap. So over the past few months, we made some amazing progress connecting students in our country. And the way I see it is that progress would not have been possible without Wi-Fi. Now that means there's more work to do. As you know, Wi-Fi 6 has just been launched and Wi-Fi 7 is already on the horizon. So we also have work to do to improve performance, increase spectrum efficiency, reduce costs, and most importantly, make the consumer experience better. So one of the ways we're doing that at the FCC is we are supersizing Wi-Fi with 160 megahertz channels in the 5.9 and 6 gigahertz bands. And right now we're exploring new opportunities for very low power devices that can enable a whole new generation of innovation and virtual and augmented reality technologies in vehicle services and other emerging technologies. So stay tuned. Plus we've got a number of actions to expand access to 3.5 gigahertz band spectrum, including clearing the way for commercial access in Puerto Rico and Guam for the first time. And we've started a rulemaking to promote unlicensed innovation in the 60 gigahertz band, including for new services like wide gig. See, all of this means is that Wi-Fi is a powerful force in the economy. The FCC has recognized it, and I think it's time for more of it. And the bands I just mentioned, I think, are the right place to start. And of course, the work we're doing to help close the homework gap and make Wi-Fi access meaningful for more people and more kids in this country is also part of it. So I just want to thank you all for the work you do to support these efforts. And I hope that working together, 
we are going to achieve much more. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. We certainly appreciate all you do. Um, in particular, thank you for uh, being so clear about the value of Wi-Fi uh, in today's society. For everything you do for Wi-Fi, license spectrum, and generally for connectivity, we, we appreciate you. And again, thank you for taking your time today to address our audience. On behalf of the over 900 members of Wi-Fi Alliance, thank you.